Gracious Lord, our loving Father in heaven, Lord, what a wonderful privilege and opportunity, Lord, you have granted us, Lord, to learn, to study your word in the quietness of time, Lord, even though life is full of hustle and bustle and we rush through doing so many things, Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you, Lord, for all my brothers and sisters who are joining here and who have a passion to learn and to grow into a deeper relationship with you. Lord, we thank you for our pastor and his family who continue to serve tirelessly with great sacrifice. I know, Lord, the load they take. Lord, thank you, Father, for being with our pastor, his family, and all of us. Thank you, Lord, for taking care of us and giving us good health and strength so that we are able to sit down and study together. Lord, we commit this time of study and meditation into your hand. We ask, Lord, that your presence be with us. Lord, open our hearts and minds because, Lord, in the ultimate analysis, only, Lord, you have to unlock our hearts and minds. Give us, Lord, a good understanding of your word. And may your word sink deep into our hearts and recesses and may it become a part and parcel of our life, Lord, and help us, Father, to reciprocate your love and to grow into a deeper relationship with you and allow your love to flow to others. Lord, we ask your special blessings upon this time as we study together. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name we ask all this. Amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, Franklin. Last time we had... Uh stopped with, uh, I think, 10.11, where we discussed about uh, the prayer. We are discussing the section where we uh, are unpacking the whole meaning of a Christian. And for a Christian, prayer is uh, an invaluable activity. It is something that we <clears throat> believe in and we trust and know that God hears us. But we are also looking at the pattern which Jesus left us in terms of our prayer. And we are going to see how this pattern that Jesus left us has some meaning to us. Obviously, Jesus did not say that we must say this prayer you know, again and again. Uh, that uh, has become a practice in many denominations. But Jesus himself said that this is a pattern by which you pray. This is how you may pray. He didn't say that this is the prayer you have to do, you know, on a regular basis. Uh, the prayer has tremendous meaning. And we asked the question last time, why do we address God as Father? It's very interesting that it's only in uh, the New Testament and with Jesus Christ, the concept of Father becomes uh, very pro pronounced. Uh, it wasn't as pronounced in the Old Covenant under the, uh, for the Israelites, but Jesus brings in this whole dimension of God being a father. And obviously that uh, very clearly uh, you know, helps us to understand that God is interested in a, in a definitely in a relationship, but it's not just any relationship. It's not... Uh, just a lord, master, and you know, slave or a king type relationship, even though he is the lord, he is the master, he is a king. But I think Jesus helps us to understand that, that God wants to take our relationship much, much more deeper. So, uh, and so the whole concept of father comes in. It also shows where Jesus is in all of this, in our relationship with. God as father, Jesus shows that it is a union with him that gives us the privilege of addressing God as father. Jesus is showing that in him, we have a very special relationship with God. All right. So um, we, we, we left it at that. So I'm going to pick up the uh, reading from uh, question 12 onwards. Uh, if uh, I think Praveen is going to bring up the uh, the material on the screen so you can read along with me, follow me as I read. We are going to 12, 10.12. 
The question in 10.12, uh, if uh, Praveen can just scroll it down a bit. Yeah, there you are. The question is, what is meant by addressing God as our Father in heaven? Now, remember, we are now going to unpack the entire Lord's Prayer as it is uh, titled. And each one has, I think, uh, some significance to us. It brings a tremendous amount of meaning in our relationship with God. So let's see uh, what uh, this question uh, means when it says, what does it mean by addressing God as our Father in heaven? The answer reads, although God is everywhere, God is said to exist and dwell in heaven. Uh, while God is free to enter into the closest relationship with the creature, God does not belong to the order of created beings. Heaven is the seat of divine authority in creation, the created place from which God reigns in glory and brings salvation to earth. Our opening address in the Lord's Prayer expresses our confidence that we rest securely in God's sovereign yet intimate care and that nothing on earth lies beyond the reach of God's grace. All right, so uh, let's uh, just do a little unpacking there. Uh, it mentions to us that our Father in heaven, God is in heaven. Um, let me just refer to my notes here. Now, we, we started out by saying, you know, the very fact that God, uh, uh, Jesus, asks us to address God as Father, it's very clear that he wants a relationship, a very special relationship that goes beyond uh, just kingship and lordship and, you know, mastership and all of those. It is, it is fatherhood. Uh, God is a father to us. And it also presupposes that he wants an intimate relationship, a, a close relationship, right? It, uh, uh, he wants to include us as his children, sons and daughters. Now, uh, by becoming or positioning himself as father, that intimacy becomes possible. That intimacy becomes real. If he just remained as king and lord, I think that intimacy probably would be wanting. And so by positioning himself as father, he is now facilitating an intimacy which goes beyond just a formal relationship like we would have with a dignitary, like a king or a, or a lord. Now, the answer also mentions that God does not belong to our created order. Right. I mean, he's not a creature. We are creatures. We are created. But by becoming our father, uh, the relationship between creator and creature now becomes not only possible, but also intimate. All right. And uh, interestingly, it mentions that it, uh, the, the address is our father in heaven. What is this heaven? Right. I mean, this is something that uh, we can endlessly debate. But uh, recently we were, uh, you know, looking, I mean, to say, uh, listening to a lecture by the president of our seminary, Grace Communion Seminary, uh, Dr. Gary Dedo is uh, the, the one in charge there. And in his lecture, he mentioned that heaven is like a meeting place between uh, human and divine all right let me read to you a scripture in acts chapter 10 uh just quickly go to acts chapter sorry acts chapter 1 and it talks about uh jesus christ ascending into heaven and in verse 10 acts chapter 1 and verse 10 it uh, describes how jesus now is ascending uh, it says, they were looking intently, I'm reading Acts 1 and verse 10. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. And verse 11 says, men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? The same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. 
so the, the, the there is a mention of heaven there and jesus is being received into heaven uh, and obviously it would con the, the connotation is that he is going to the father uh, and uh, you know if you remember in his second coming we are going to meet him in the air it is like a heaven and so you could say that all of this is an indication that god's intention is to bring uh, a, a you know uh, humanity and divinity close once again our father in heaven father is an intimate way to address god and then there is this meeting place in heaven uh basically showing that humans have access to our god our triune god uh because uh god is father and we would say he is in heaven but jesus in his humanity is taking us to the presence of the father and so humanity in in jesus christ the glorified humanity is now in union with the father and of course the holy spirit uh, is very much part of the godhead so hope that uh, just gives you some perspective as we discuss you know uh, uh, the, the whole aspect of father and the father being in heaven and ultimately is it interesting that uh, the prophecy it is prophesied that we will have a new heaven and a new earth uh, and god's ultimate purpose is in one sense heaven coming down to the earth <laughs> uh, god his god himself will be with human beings with humanity and so god and humans together and so heaven and earth in one sense will come together and so by addressing god as father in heaven i think it just opens up uh, uh, you know tremendous amount of meaning there anyway let me leave it there because uh, uh, i don't want to do too much of speculation because these are all something that uh, goes beyond our full comprehension but i will end by one thought which uh, is in the answer where it says nothing on earth lies beyond the reach of god's grace nothing on earth lies beyond the reach of god's grace and so uh, by you know father and heaven uh, it is all basically meaning that god's grace is now infusing us as his creatures and he is gathering us up into himself to to one day you know reside eternally in his embrace in his bosom like we have the imagery of abraham being in you know uh, god's bosom all right enough said there let's move to the next question and uh, let's read 10.13 the question reads what is meant by the the first petition hallowed be your name all right hallowed be your name so that is how the the prayer unfolds let's read the answer it is placed first because it comprehends the goal and purpose of the whole prayer the glory of god's name is the highest concern in all that we pray and do god's name stands for god's being as well as god's attributes uh, works and reputation when we pray for his name to be hallowed we are asking that we and all others will know and glorify god as god really is and that all things will be ordered in a way that demonstrates god's faithfulness goodness and glory all right uh once again uh just to pick up a few points from that answer hallowed be your name that's how the prayer uh, is given to us by Jesus. God's name, you know, basically, as it says, represents who God is, right? So when we are sort of glorifying God's name, we are glorifying God for who he is, all right? 
Uh, and who is God? And we have in our recent understanding come to know God in such a, you know, such an expanded way, uh, you know, in terms of the, his very essence being love. And of course, uh, which manifests itself in goodness, in faithfulness, and ultimately redeeming us to glorify us, to give us glorified bodies. All of this represents God. And so in one sense, as we glorify his name, as we hallow his name, uh, we were just discussing Sanjirao's hallowed presence. <laughs> but uh, uh, God's hallow, you know, be, uh, name being hallowed uh, is the purpose for which God stands for us. It is not just glorifying God and in a vacuum, but God's glorification has a very, very strong connection with us. His very purpose for us is being glorified because God is who he is in terms of, you know, tremendous amount of love and, and of course, his relationship with us. All right. Uh, so as we recognize God's attributes and works and, of course, his reputation in terms of, uh, you know, his steadfastness and his love for us and the fact that he never, ever will recede in his love for us uh, shows the greatness of God. And yet that great God coming to reside with us and gathering us as human beings into you know himself so uh so it is fitting for us to glorify his name uh because it very clearly represents and uh manifests who he is to us all right uh let's move to the next one once again feel free to comment or question uh you know ask any questions a little later on let me just go through maybe uh, uh, three more, hopefully, and then we'll pause for a few questions. 10.14, the question reads, what is meant by the second petition? Your kingdom come. And the answer is, we are asking God to come and rule among us, helping us share in his ways through faith, love, and justice. We pray for both the church and the world that God will rule in our hearts through faith, in our personal relationships through love, and in our institutional affairs through justice. We ask especially that the gospel will not be withheld from us, but rightly preached and received. We pray that the church will be upheld and increase, particularly when in distress, and that all the world will more and more hear of and submit to God's reign, until the day that Christ establishes the fullness of the kingdom of God and we live forever with God in perfect peace. So, uh, your kingdom come. All right. So that is uh, a prayer that I think is becoming more and more meaningful for us uh, as we look around us and we see what, happen what is happening around us, the tremendous amount of uh, suffering and pain and misery. And then the tremendous amount of evil that we see all around us. Uh, we certainly long for the kingdom. That is something that we have prayed with tremendous amount of earnestness. We look forward to it. We were so passionate about the kingdom that we even made mistakes in predicting its actual date of coming. Uh, we made fool of ourselves by giving dates. And there are still people fooling themselves and fooling others by giving dates. And there are plenty of dates coming from the United States of America. <laughs> Pardon me, Anil. But, uh, you know, there are a whole bunch of these fellows coming out and saying that Christ is coming in October or in December, you know. Uh, but your kingdom come. The certainty of the kingdom of God coming is absolutely, you know, without doubt. All right. But what do we mean when we pray your kingdom come? Obviously, we mean that we want his rule we see the misrule that's going around we see the unrighteous ruling 
rulership that you know and leadership that we see all over and i don't have to remind anil of <laughs> the leadership qualities we have around the world right <laughs> uh, we want god's rule but when we talk about god's rule we also want to submit so when we say your kingdom come we are also saying lord we want to come under your reign we want to submit to your reign because why is why do we long for god's reign because it's a reign of love right uh, it's a reign of justice uh, it's a reign of faith faithfulness uh, it's a reign that is meant to liberate to bring freedom and not to enslave and not to snoop and, and not to you know uh, cause us harm uh, so we long for that kingdom uh, and we know that one of you know sooner than later hopefully the kingdom will be established in its fullness notice i say in its fullness in one sense the kingdom was inaugurated as jesus himself came he was the representative of the kingdom he was the kingdom in one sense because he said you know the kingdom is at hand repent and believe the kingdom is at hand and he was the one who was inaugurating the kingdom but obviously it is not here in its fullness we are looking forward to the fullness of god's kingdom so as gary dedo our president of our seminary would say we are living in between the times uh, so we are living in between the times and uh, i just want to i just want to clarify one thing and that is we shouldn't mistake the church to be the kingdom the church is not the kingdom it is a sign of the kingdom uh, but the kingdom in its fullness is still future all right uh, so it will obviously be uh, in here in its fullness uh, at the second coming of jesus christ and when he brings the fullness of the kingdom because like i said he is the kingdom uh, and that's the time when we can live with a sense of justice and peace and faithfulness uh, forever you know in god's uh, presence okay um that's basically what i wanted to say about the kingdom now there's so much more you can we can say i think we uh we did discuss and talked about uh the kingdom at length at another time but we'll 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 uh, uh, uh we'll come back to that you know maybe some other time let's move on then to 10.15 i'm trying to see if i can maybe just finish up with just two more and then we'll have some discussion let's go to 10.15 that we are now going to the third petition which will which is your will be done on earth as it is in heaven the answer reads all that god wills is consistent with the nature and character of the triune god revealed in jesus christ whatever god wills he eventually brings it to pass whether we desire it or not the phrase on earth as it is in heaven means that we are asking for the grace to do god's will on earth in the way that it is being done in heaven gladly and from the heart we thus ask that all opposition to god's will might be removed from the earth and especially from our own hearts we ask for the freedom to conform our desires and deeds more fully to god's so that we might be completely delivered from our sin so you be yield ourselves in the life and in death to god's will and we expectantly look forward to the day when heaven and earth will be reunited in the new heaven and earth so uh your will be done as it is in heaven so there are two aspects to this we want god's perfect will to be done and his fullness of his kingdom and his righteous reign to be here on the earth but it also means that we are willing to be submissive to that will we are entering into his uh, so your will be done and notice we want his will to be done as it says we want it gladly and from the heart in other words uh, god's will should be accepted without coercion without force god doesn't force us to accept his will we want it 
and submit to it willingly. And it's only then we can experience it in its, uh, you know, in its purest form, right? Uh, so we want to experience his will from our hearts. We want to accept his will from our hearts. It is not that God wants to force his will. And we know that God, uh, you know, has made us beings with free choice. Uh, we have free will. And so he wants us to choose to accept him and his will for us. So those are a few thoughts I can, I can offer you from that particular point. Let me look at one more point and then we'll uh, stop for uh, some discussion. If we can go to 10.16, okay. 10.16, uh, the question reads, what is meant by the fourth petition? Give us this day our daily bread. We ask God to provide for all our needs, for we know that God who cares for us in every area of our life has promised us temporal as well as spiritual blessings. God commands us to pray each day for all that we need and no more so that we will learn to rely completely on God. And we pray that we will use what we are given wisely, remembering especially the poor and needy. Along with every living creature, we look to God, the source of all generosity to bless us and nourish us, nourish us according to the divine good pleasure. All right. So uh, give us this day our daily bread. Very clearly, uh, Jesus is trying to help us understand that our reliance is on God. He is the one. He is the one who blesses us with all that uh, we need and require. He provides for us. Uh, and as we recognize our need, we are also prompted to recognize the need of others. Uh, there are many who require daily bread and daily bread is a metaphor for all our needs. It's not just physical food, but there is also something important that we need to recognize that as we pray for our daily bread, uh, there is also spiritual needs that we have. All right. And uh, uh, we'll come to that as we go along. Uh, but I want to ask a question and I'm going to see if you have any thoughts on that. You know, it, Jesus says uh, for us to ask, give us this day our daily bread. Why didn't he tell us to ask God for a 25 year supply of bread? <laughs> Why is it that he says daily bread? All right. I mean, uh, is God, is, is Jesus saying God is stingy? that we should just, you know, just ask for the pittance and, you know, just enough. I, I want you to think about that and maybe you can offer me some thoughts on it. I have my own thoughts about it. Is God stingy? Is he, is he very niggardly? I mean, sometimes we tend to even think that, we, you know, when we pray, we might think that, you know, I mean, we need to do something to force God's hand to be generous. So we approach him as though he is just, you know, fed up with us and not really willing to bless us. And uh, he is not necessarily a generous God. He tells us to be generous, but he's not necessarily generous. Think about that. And let's stop there and let's get into our discussion. Okay. okay. Uh, what are your thoughts? Maybe we can begin with the stingy thing. If you, you might have some other questions. Any thoughts about why God says, uh, Jesus says, uh, you know, daily bread? Sikandar, you have a thought. Go ahead. Not on bread, sir, but uh, you said church is, church is not the kingdom, but the basis of the uh, structure of creation itself is uh, forming a church. means uh, the members who has been called out has to reach the pinnacle of glory. Uh, the individually, it depends upon individual transformation. It means uh, uh, in our life, we keep everything according to God's law. Why? submitting ourselves. God's grace is there, but we have to submit ourselves. Introspection is there. And as finally, the persons who have been called and raised and reached the, the, that status, that becomes the church. And you said uh, church is not the kingdom that I could not uh, get it. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 
Yes, uh, you described the church. Yeah, very true. And uh, that is uh, uh, what you said is correct. But the church are an, uh, uh, is, a is a representative of the kingdom. We are signs for a future fullness of the kingdom. Like the Apostle Paul says, we are ambassadors, right? So we represent the kingdom by submitting to God's will. But we have not ushered the kingdom in its fullness as Jesus would in the second coming. So you could say we, you know, Mr. Armstrong, I think, used to say this. We are, uh, I don't know I, whether this is true. We are a, a kingdom in embryo or something like that. I'm not sure. I, I can't remember the exact words. But uh, the, the, the church is not a kingdom in the sense that we must have our own government. We must have our own rules or we must have our own territory. No, that is not what the church is. The church is representative, uh, is, is the body of Jesus Christ, right? It is the body of Christ representing Christ and being Christ's hands and legs, if you mean, if, if I can use that phrase, uh, to show the world that there is a future kingdom coming. All right. Anil, I think you had a thought to add to that. You had your hands up. No, yeah, the, the question on the kingdom, the church uh, as part of the kingdom, I think the, the, the kingdom is supposed to be reflected in the church. That means that whatever the, are God's attribute, that is what the church should, should be uh, living every day and, and, and showing to the world. That is uh, one thought on the kingdom and the church relationship. And second, as to the daily bread issue, of course, and God can give us our bread for 100 years, that's not an issue. But the fact that he asks us to ask for it daily is so that we depend on him day by day and not get complacent that, okay, God is taking care of us, no problem, I have prayed for him today and I'm through for the next 10 years. Satan. So, and, and there's always Satan waiting in the wings to attack you. So basically... Jesus wants us to depend on him day to day, ask for whatever we need, not whatever we want, but ask for our needs day by day, which he will, I'm sure he will supply. Okay, right. Thank you, Anil. You basically mean that it is basic reliance on God. I might add, it's also showing how we need to relate with God on a daily basis, right? Uh, it's renewing a relationship, right? But if I can come back to Sikkim, the, uh, uh, did those Comments help uh, answer your question, Sikinda? Somewhat, sir. Not completely. Okay. So feel free to pen down your question and you can al always send it to me on WhatsApp and I will, uh, you know, because the kingdom is a very big subject yes. and uh, I'll and be willing to help you with uh, your specific question. All right. I'm 70 satisfied. <laughs> okay. okay. All right. Yes. Yes. The floor is open. Uh, feel free to bring, come in with your comments or questions? Sachin, I can see you're leaning forward. You have something to say. Now, recently, uh, I met a friend and we had this discussion and he, uh, he sort of shared the other side of uh, um, our dependence on God. And I'll give you this thing. I am, my question might not be inferring anything, but we were talking about, he has a daughter. She's uh, Avisha is how long? Old? Four? Six. So I said, are you planning to uh, invest something for her education um, schemes or something? And since she's six year old, even one rupee a day would probably help her at least a month of uh, um, education fees in a year. So he said, that's a very good idea. But don't worry. God will, God will take care of my future. So I, I want to bring in here the, the, the over dependence that we, we forgot the, our, our dependency on him to furnish this thing. And then we take it granted that, uh, if I am responsible to do something today, which is also to secure, and this applies more to our efforts to secure our future. Uh, the physical uh, future that we do, whether it is tomorrow or whether it is any day of the future. So I feel it's a very thin line 
and maybe we can uh, talk a bit more on that yeah yeah uh, uh, such and i think what you mean is that when we say that you know when we re rely on god on a daily basis uh, that does not mean that uh, that we neglect to plan our future right i'm not sure if that is what you mean that's my inferring would be okay all right Man, yes. it doesn't it doesn't mean that we don't uh, you know plan our future i think anil and reka had a thought please go ahead okay. i was talking about god's sovereignty and man's responsibility we forget we are um, uh, hindus generally they are very fatalistic they believe in fate always but fate is there you have to do your part that's what god wants from us right okay so it's like doing our part yeah the once again i can say that that prayer does not discourage us from uh planning in a manner in a way that will secure a future but if i can just uh, add to that uh the basic i i said that daily bread does not necessarily mean you know the double roti we get from uh, the bakery uh the daily bread is uh, you know symbolic or metaphorical uh to the fact that we depend on god we we have our being in god uh, mm -hmm. you know we live and move and have our being in god we he sustains us every moment right so we are we are what you say recognizing our you know very being being sustained by god all right so that is probably what uh, i would like to offer in addition any other thoughts yeah i would like to add a small bit to what sachin has said sir chilla yes go ahead yeah. uh, in telugu there is a saying uh, which says gali lo deepam betti devuda devuda anukodani that means you don't put a small lamp in the you know where it is windy and you expect god to uh, you know prevent it from putting off okay. right uh, it is it takes us it is just a matter of common sense that when of course god definitely can uh, you know uh, allow the lamp to shine even if it is windy if it is necessary uh, but it is not for us uh, you know uh, with common sense nobody would do that Yes. so what uh, sachin said is even though we depend on god for everything we should also have our planning because god also has asked us to be you know wise uh, in our daily living we can't just depend on god we have to depend on god for everything but we also have to do our part wisely uh, so uh, we do our part you know we sow the seed and uh, leave it to god's hand to allow it to bloom uh, that's what i think uh, we as christians do and when we do that we are definitely trusting god because just by sowing a seed we cannot guarantee that the seed would you uh, know come up uh, and live up like a plant right. ultimately god's grace has to be on it it mm. has to have its you know cycle and to grow up god definitely has to play his part so we do our part and trust god that he will take care of the rest um, yes. so that's yes. what i just wanted to add ravin i want to come in here yeah yes please paul okay uh, we have seen uh, it's part like what uh, jashila just said uh, in matthew 6 36 we see the uh i can read it out uh, see the birds of the sky that they don't uh so neither do they reap nor gather into barns your heavenly father feeds them so here it is uh you know father is giving the assurance to us not to worry for tomorrow and in a way from our side we need to trust and have faith that uh, you know tomorrow we will be provided of the basic and the birds i mean the uh, the common saying is bird brain you know but we need to have the sense you know the spiritual food and the physical food to have trust and faith in god and not worry about things god is there god is there for us he will do the needful so just place the trust that is what i feel okay thanks for your thoughts pauline uh, over to pastor back <laughs> uh. 
Any any thoughts on uh, the prayer aspect? Uh, of course, I think we sufficiently discussed the, you know, God is not stingy, and I think we have understood what it means. Uh, any other aspects on uh, what we discussed? Hallowed be your name, our Father in heaven. Or we discussed about heaven once again being a metaphor for where divinity and humanity in one sense comes together. You know, uh, we, sh we shouldn't think that heaven is some place of residence for God because <laughs> God is spirit and does not need, you know, some... Uh, Res, you know, residential uh, palace for him to rest, rest himself. <laughs> uh, heaven is once again a metaphor. Right? I have a question again, sir. Yes, Joshua, go ahead. Uh, normally in these uh, churches, um, the traditional churches, uh, they pray this Lord's Prayer on a regular basis uh, at the end of every service. Yes. Uh, we don't do that in our church. Uh, is it because we don't want to be, uh, you know, ritualistic? It's a kind of ritual in many churches. But right. is it because that we don't want to be ritualistic or is there, I mean, we haven't given it a thought or do you think it is not necessary? Why is it that we don't have that in okay. our church? Okay. We have certainly given it a thought, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, in, in the past. And like you rightly said, we didn't want to be ritualistic. Uh, mm -hmm. And we we believe that God, or rather Jesus, did not mean that we have to repeat this. Now, mm -hmm. is it wrong to repeat it and uh, say it on a regular basis, collectively as a church? There is no indication that it is wrong to do that. Uh, but we have not done it because we didn't want it to just be done out of, you know, wrote out of uh, some kind of, you know, fulfilling the agenda for the day. Uh, we want everything to be meaningful and it should make sense. And so that's perhaps one of the reasons why we never thought about it. But for example, I mean, we, we have a benediction, which we repeat on a regular basis. Similarly, you can repeat the Lord's Prayer as it is titled, uh, and have tremendous meaning with it. So it's perfectly all right to do that. In some churches, we have the rec recitation of the Nicene Creed, right? And that brings back, once again, reminding us of various aspects of the, the fundamentals of our Christian faith. And so if we do it in that manner, that's perfectly all right. So the question is, Joshila, do you want now a reading of uh, the Lord's Prayer Every every Sunday, <laughs> uh, no no problem. We can have, as you said, sometimes. Okay. At least, or if, if it is making more uh, meaningful, you know, if it can be clubbed with a sermon, or maybe on some occasions we can always have. I think. Certainly, I think so. That will be very meaningful. If we, if it is done in a in a very meaningful manner, then of course it'll have more effect. I suppose. Otherwise, we just wrote it off, and then you know. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to anybody. I'm sorry, Praveen, I didn't give you any opportunity to bring your thoughts in. Uh, you no, no, it's fine. It's fine, Pastor. It's fine. Yeah, because we are slowly slipping out on time. Uh, yeah, it's fine. Any... Shanti wants to share. Sorry, yeah, go Franklin ahead. Franklin as well. Yeah. Let's uh, begin with Shanti and then Franklin. Thank you, Praveen, for noticing me. <laughs> I've been putting. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, any. Uh... Maybe um, I'm coming on the question of give us this day our daily bread yeah. from a different perspective. Okay. Uh, though I do want to say two sentences about uh, the time when Jonah, uh, about the, what Sachin, Joshila and all the others discussed about, uh, you know, if you did not, you did not work for it, you have to be responsible towards your future too. And being wise rather. Uh, Jonah goes and sleeps and the Lord makes the plant grow around him, gives him shade. And he very, very uh, interestingly, the Lord asks him, you have not planted this, nor you have watered, watered it. Yet you are so sad to go it away. <laughs> so imagine how much more if I have planted it, I have watered it and I have seen it come like that. So, 
you know what do you what do you feel about it it actually makes sense in in terms that there is the way that the lord wants us to be diligent as well in a, with our work uh, and be with you know work with integrity and uh, i guess that is what he said when when he gave adam so you shall till the ground what not with a snap and the lord will give it anyway he loves me anyway but you know he asked him to till the ground do that work you know he wants us to work with integrity so Uh, just that was two lines but uh, i wanted to comment upon give us this day our daily bread from a different perspective i want us to read john 632 to 35 go ahead read it yeah so it says jesus then said to them truly truly i say to you it was not moses who gave you the bread from heaven but my father gives you the true bread from heaven for the bread of god is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world so they said to him sir give us this bread always jesus said to them i am the bread of life whoever comes to me shall not hunger and whoever believes in me shall never thirst so i want to bring upon when we pray this it's not only speaking about daily bread which is manna just with our physical stomachs but also manna from heaven which is the lord himself because he is the bread of life it says he is bread from heaven for us and so i guess this when we say these words we are also saying i need jesus every day in my life well is he not there he is there but it makes so much sense to the, to the father when we go and say dad i need you in my life he is there but it makes so much of sense to say i need i need you so i guess it also gives us a perspective where it where the jesus himself is teaching us about open your eyes to the priorities in your life yes physically also is there but also there is much more beyond because this is just a transition phase for us to get into the real life which will start after our death okay i think uh, that's very meaningful when you read john 6 that uh, jesus says i am the bread of life and so uh, uh, i think it connects very well in the sense that once again we see uh, our need is much deeper than just physical bread our needs and our uh, you know we are made in such a way where we need to have god and who said that Uh, we have a vacuum inside of us in the shape of god and only god can fill it and so yes i think that's very meaningful uh, uh let me see uh, franklin go ahead i think you had a thought sir can am i audible yes yes go ahead sir there is one statement in the bible sir the kingdom of god is within you in the past we said this is a gross mistranslation the correct rendering should be the kingdom of god is in the midst of you please clarify <laughs> okay uh i i can't remember exactly the original text there and whether we found out uh i mean uh, 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 if if there was that mistake like you say or a gross or a, or mistranslation but you can take it in both ways and i think you can still find meaning in it if it is in the midst of you obviously you know what it means jesus christ is in the midst of them all right mm-hmm. now if it is within you you can you can also recognize it as the holy spirit being within you then they are all kingdom they are they are kingdom life you know i think uh, reka and anil have any thoughts on that uh, no that's fine that's no, good that's like, good yeah, point that's what we wanted to say yeah. too it's the same yeah. okay Right, Praveen, you have. I have talk- something to say. I, this is on a lighter note. We just say life is fragile. Handle with prayer. <laughs> That's how it says. Somebody said it. Okay. All right. We'll give the final word to Praveen. Hi, uh, nothing much, Pastor. Basically, um, uh, we have read uh, the spiritual aspect of it, and uh, uh, in a. um like ecclesiastical perspective of um, the lord's prayer ecclesiastical in the sense in the, in the in the setup of a church as well as we read in terms of uh, the spiritual life spiritual perspective we have read 
uh, it is also important for us to read the Lord's Prayer in its very context. When Jesus taught this prayer to the Jewish people, especially to the disciples and all, uh, every word he said meant, uh, meant in a different uh, sense to them. For us, many a times we take things as more spiritual, spiritual, spiritual. There are certain things when we uh, hear Jesus speak, we need to take them in the context mm -hmm. of a Jewish audience. So perhaps maybe this, since the time is over, I will bring this perspective later when we have time. That's a good idea. Yes. Very good. Yes, I think unfortunately time has gone by and we have taken a slightly extra, few extra minutes. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, like I always say, uh, there is so much we can learn from each other and we are helping one another. And so uh, we look forward to this again and your contributions are so very much uh, useful and welcome. Uh, Anil, could you lead us in a closing prayer? Sure. <clears throat> Let's pray. <clears throat> oh, great God, our Father in heaven, Father, it's a privilege to come before you. We thank you, Lord, for your bounties that you shower upon us, Father, each and every day. You give us our daily bread and you give us At more least. than that, Father. We thank you so much for your grace. We thank you for the understanding you give us, Lord. We thank you most of all for our Savior, Jesus Christ. And Lord, we thank you for your word, which is truth and life itself, God. Lord, we are very grateful for the time that we are able to spend honoring you and trying to understand your word more and more deeply. Father, as we go about our day, please be with us, dismiss us, God, and look over us, God, and help us to be a light as we go out, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Bless us, we pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.